Shane Beamer exuded some head coaching qualities last week that resemble one of the greatest coaches to ever coach the game of college football. You are Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, your show for the latest headlines and potential storylines on South Carolina Gamecock athletics. I'm Andrew Lyon, the host of this podcast, and also a staff writer for Gamecocks Digest over on SI.com. Thank you for making Locked On Gamecocks your first watch or listen here today. We are free and available on YouTube and also wherever you get your audio podcasts daily. Before we get into this Monday edition of Locked On Gamecocks, I want to let y'all know that this show is brought to you by HelloFresh. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Go to HelloFresh.com slash college60 and use code COLLEGE60 for 60% off plus free shipping. Shane Beamer has already showcased to a lot of people in the college football realm why he's already on track to be one of the best coaches in the SEC and potentially the entire country, again, if he keeps trending in the right direction. And sometimes you have certain moments, both in games and maybe when it comes to press conferences or practices, where you can look back and point to those moments and say, that shows that this coach is evolving as we currently speak. And I think that we had one of those moments last week at Shane Beamer's Tuesday press conference because with his latest coaching tactics, Shane Beamer is resembling Nick Saban in trying to find ways to keep South Carolina locked in as they get into the final few practices leading into their spring game on April 15th. So here's what Shane Beamer had to say regarding that. Or what's, what's important for you to see as a head coach the last few practices? Uh, just how we continue to <clears throat> progress um, and get better. That's what I talked to the team about last after practice. Like it, it, the human nature is okay. We're ten practices down. Next week's the last week of spring break. Uh, we got Easter weekend coming up. Human nature is to go. Whew, all right, we're good, and just kind of coast. And and I talked to the team about this today. I went back and like this week last year, we didn't do a great job academically we didn't do a great job keeping the locker room clean a lot of things like that where maybe last year we took a breath and 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 um didn't get better that's what i'm looking for is how we continue to get better players coaches all of us uh, every single person in this building there's no complacency and there better not be any complacency after 10 practices with one week of spring practice left we got a a lot of work to do and uh, that's what i want to see how we continue to progress and get better And then also, um, you know, some of these older guys, do they continue to take a step and improve or do they get caught by some of these young guys? Y'all have been around here long enough or followed, been around me long enough to know that, you know, there's no jobs that are given here right now. You earn and compete for everything. And if anybody's getting complacent and think they've got a job locked up, they're going to be shocked here, you know, pretty quickly. And I want to see these young guys continue to come along and and push these uh, push these older guys. Now, I know that some people are going to hear these comments, and with what I said earlier regarding, you know, this being a shining moment in terms of Shane Beamer's evolution as a coach, and they're going to say, well, Andrew, every head coach in college football doesn't want their team to get complacent. Every single coach wants their young guys to push their older guys. What exactly is going on here with these statements that are a little bit different? How is this reminiscent of Nick Saban? Well, there's a few key differences here compared to some of the usual jargon that you might hear from college football coaches that I want to point out here. Firstly, Shamey referred to his note-taking at some point in his answer here and talking about looking back at last year. And... What's really unique about Shane Beamer is the fact that he doesn't just take notes, but the fact that he does refer back to these moments. It's almost like he goes back and he looks at the steps that he has taken to get the program to where they're at at this current point 
in his tenure. And he doesn't do that just to see how far the team has come. Obviously, that's a primary reason. But he also does it to sort of remind himself of, you know, areas that the team needs to get better in. And that's what led to him talking about the sort of holistic approach, which is the second point that I want to make here. A lot of football coaches, when they coach even at a major program, a Power 5 program, they just want to be able to coach ball. They don't want to really have to deal too much with stuff off the field. They might try to put up this facade that, you know, they do care about the guys and what else going on off the field and outside the building. But in reality, they care about what's going on on Saturdays and how those guys are doing when they're on the practice field. And they don't put as much attention to what these guys are doing in the classroom, how they're carrying themselves in the locker room, when they're not always watching every single player on their roster. Shane Beamer is clearly not one of those coaches. And he talked about how, hey, this time last year, you know, there was a lot of momentum surrounding the program last year. But he mentioned, look, we didn't do a good job of keeping the locker room clean enough, having a tidy, organized environment. We did not prioritize academics enough from the player's perspective. And there's a lot of coaches out there that would sort of delegate these responsibilities of reminding these football players how important these aspects are. They would delegate those to their assistant coaches. And again, they would just sort of leave that alone unless it becomes a real serious problem to where they have to address it, say, in a team meeting. On the face of this, it does not seem like that Shane Beamer is that kind of coach. It seems like that this is something that he specifically is involved in and he tracks meticulously throughout the course of the offseason months and, of course, going through their actual seasons in the fall. And then the last thing that really stuck out to me with these comments here is that Shane Beamer took this as an opportunity to challenge and essentially remind everyone on the football team that, look, your spot is not guaranteed. If there's a younger guy below you that is pushing you hard enough and doing better than you on the practice field, then that guy is going to play, and you should not be surprised when that happens. Now, obviously... There are certain guys like Spencer Rattler and Antoine Juice Wells that are going to be starters this fall. Those kind of guys, yeah, you're not really worried about them. But you're directing this at every single other starting spot just about on your roster. And these are the kinds of characteristics in terms of being process-oriented, having a holistic approach, and having collective accountability with everyone on the team these same characteristics all point back to coaches like Nick Saban. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that Shane Beamer is going to go down as the greatest coach in college football history by the time he's done here. That does not mean that he's going to win seven national championships. But it is clear that while Shane Beamer is obviously running his program in his own unique way and something that has really captured the attention of recruits and college football pundits alike, his experience is around multiple college football coaches, including a Kirby Smart, who is a disciple from the Nick Saban coaching tree, is molding him to where he's not satisfied with where the program is at. He wants the program to elevate continuously and try to find ways to get better, even if it means he's got to nitpick certain areas. Like, again, keeping a locker room clean, which is important, obviously, but it's not something that every single head coach uses a press conference to throw out there. Shane Beamer apparently is one. And again, I think that just speaks so much into the growth that Shane Beamer has already undergone as an SEC head football coach. And if you're a South Carolina fan, honestly, I think these comments should fire you up and it should make you really and truthfully understand that this is a guy that cares about everything in his program. Again, he is not just there to basically put on a headset and coach on Saturdays and then leave everything else to everybody on his staff and just not mess with it. This is a guy that cares. He doesn't just care about the players and what else going on in their personal lives, but he cares about everybody. He holds everyone to the same standard. That is what you got to have if you want to contend for championships. And South Carolina, based on these comments and what they've done on the recruiting front and how they progressed in the first couple years of the Beamer era, they are on their way to doing just that. Now, 
One way that I did just mention that they're doing this is through recruiting, and that is by going after some of the best prospects in the country. And there's some prospects in the 2024 recruiting class that Shane Beamer and the staff have some pretty significant traction with, specifically Dylan Stewart and Daniel Hill. We're going to dive into just how good that traction is in just a couple moments right here on Locked on Gamecocks. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Grand slams, no hitters, and double plays are back on the baseball diamond. And there's no better place to get it on the action than FanDuel, America's number one sportsman. Because right now, new customers can step up to the plate with a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. Meaning that you can get up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if you don't win either way. Essentially, it is free money back guaranteed. FanDuel has set the Atlanta Braves' odds to win the National League East at minus 165, making the Atlanta Braves the favorite to win their sixth straight division title. And obviously, this past weekend series against the San Diego Padres was not very good, but it is a marathon, not a sprint. And the Braves obviously have got a lot of prestige and a lot of history. So if you think the Braves are going to win another division title because the Mets are going to slip up again, maybe the Phillies don't put it all together, then be sure to put your money down on that minus 165. Don't miss your chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you join FanDuel today. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. And again, this is brought to y'all by FanDuel, the official betting partner of Major League Baseball. Welcome back to this Monday edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your South Carolina Gamecocks every single day. All right, so... I talked with John Garcia Jr., Lockdown's Recruiting Insider, this past week on a variety of different targets for South Carolina's football team. And a couple of those targets we talked about were Dylan Stewart and Daniel Hill. I already included part of that conversation regarding Jamonta Waller and Justin Green on this past Friday's show. If you haven't checked that out and you're interested, feel free to go ahead and do so. But we also talked about Dylan Stewart and Daniel Hill and I wanted to include that portion of our conversation on today's show. So without further ado, let's cut on over to my conversation with John Garcia Jr. regarding these two blue chip prospects. We're going to start with arguably the biggest name on South Carolina's board for the 2024 cycle in Dylan Stewart. Now, John, since we last talked about Dylan, this one, it seems like that there's been some changes that maybe we should have seen coming because Dylan obviously is on a spring tour, honestly, right now because Busy. he's visiting multiple schools. He's visited teams like Ohio State and Alabama, and there's been some smoke from those two camps along with Georgia that uh, they maybe sort of made up some ground. And maybe that South Carolina's not behind, but now they're going to have a real stiff competition here with some big-time Blue Bloods in the sport. What are your overall thoughts on on sort of how those have played out and some of his recent announcements regarding official visits. Well, this is probably what should, we should have expected, as you mentioned, Andrew. This is arguably the number one pass rusher in this class of 2024. So no matter where he's from or when he was going to get out on the road, this was going to be the, the result. Legitimate blue blood competition across not only the SEC, but beyond with, with Ohio State, which has a fair track record of pass rushers. So uh, Stewart is well-traveled, as, as your audience knows. No pro no programs got him on campus more than, than South Carolina. I think there are over a half dozen visits at this point. And, and we know an official visit is coming back to Columbia, but so too are officials to Ohio State and Alabama, both of those programs, as you mentioned, hosting him for unofficials. And they got sort of the nod, the green light, if you will, to, to grab an official visit. All in the month of June and, and what's going to be a true heavyweight battle for, for Stewart again, as you would imagine. And then if there's another program to watch outside of those official visits, it's of course, Georgia, right? Uh, defending back-to-back -back champs. Uh, your fan base knows all too well uh, about what they do on the recruiting trail simultaneously. So yeah, I think this is to be expected, but again, it's another moment to where, you understand the trajectory of South Carolina football recruiting, right? If you're in the conversation, just look at the teams, Georgia, Alabama, Ohio State, three of the last, I don't know, six national champions, whatever the number is, that's where you want to be from a recruiting perspective. It's a different thing to contend with them and to actually beat them, but we started to see South Carolina do that a little bit 
this past cycle in 2023. So now in 24, you want to continue with some of that momentum. And, and look, I, I still don't know what's in the water in D.C. relative to South Carolina, but those prospects continue to love uh, to come down to Columbia and get that SEC experience while still residing there on the East Coast. So certainly not ready to discount South Carolina in this recruitment, especially with another official visit there on the docket. If there was one school where I think Dylan could have passed from an official visit perspective, it probably would have been South Carolina because that's the campus he has become most familiar with, yet and still he's taking the official visit. So I think that's huge news for Shane Beamer and company. He wants to do that due diligence and almost go one-to-one -one with some of the other contenders on his list. So I couldn't tell you who's the favorite between the four, and I don't think Dylan could either. He's got a lot of trips still to be taken here going forward in a recruitment that we expect to extend pretty deep into the year on top of that. So South Carolina had early momentum. They're doing a good job maintaining some of that momentum, but obviously still a long way to go here. So uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Right. And as you mentioned, you know, South Carolina being mentioned with the likes of Ohio State, Alabama and Georgia. Yes, this recruitment is going to obviously be tough, but it's a good thing that South Carolina is going after recruits that have those kind of programs that want these guys that badly, because obviously it means the staff is doing something right. And just a quick correction, I do believe that one official visit is going to Georgia. He, of course, probably will set one okay. up to Alabama. That's that's my fault, though, because I got all jumbled up when trying to name off all the schools that are interested in Dylan Stewart. So that's my bad. He probably, like one. you said, he probably take he'll probably take officials to all four of these schools just not quite set just yet right right exactly so either way South Carolina is still in a very good spot no cause for concern yet on that front so uh, moving on from an edge rusher let's talk about now an athlete on the offensive side of the ball in Daniel Hill out of the state of Mississippi. John, this is a prospect that we haven't talked about as much when you and I have had these recruiting shows together but Daniel Hill He's a prospect that's starting to get a lot of traction with South Carolina, and it kind of got kick-started with a photo that matriculated on social media about a week or two ago at an OT7 camp where he was donning some South Carolina gloves at that camp. And obviously, you know, some prospects wear gloves like that, and that school doesn't even end up being a part of, like, the final group. But right. it really does feel like that for Daniel Hill, this one is a little bit different, that South Carolina really does have um, some momentum here with this Mississippi product. Yeah. And, and I'll start there. As you mentioned, the Mississippi native, um, I'm not as intimately familiar with the South Carolina roster as you are, but I can't imagine a lot of Mississippians on that roster right now, because look, it's hard to go into that state and win recruiting battles uh, and pull those recruits out of the state of Mississippi. That said, Daniel Hill for, I think the last four five, six months has kind of been focused on out of state schools. Alabama had some early momentum with him, LSU in that mix. Um, and now we're seeing South Carolina, Auburn, Tennessee, sort of that new layer in, in his recruitment. Um, and there's no doubt that South Carolina among those schools has done the best job to this point. Now, I think he's going to Auburn this weekend and there's still probably some time left before a final decision comes in. But look, that last trip to Columbia is something that uh, he, he really lit up talking about uh, at that OT7 event that you just, just discussed, told multiple outlets that South Carolina is probably the top school right now, which is a big deal because a lot of folks in, in our I industry circles seeing him in person like, hey, we're just waiting for him to commit to Alabama. That was kind of the thought going into the winter and, and coming out of the winter into the spring, yet things have started to, to change on that front for Hill, who, by the way, is a fascinating prospect. 6'2", 220, running back, linebacker, very good receiver out of the backfield. You go watch him at these seven-on-sevens, he's making plays above the rim, uh, per se. So really fascinating athlete. You understand why there's been so much buzz throughout uh, the SEC footprint and beyond. So this isn't just a, hey, let's go into Mississippi to grab one kid there. This is let's go there to get maybe the best offensive prospect in the state who, oh, by the way, has some legitimate looks to play linebacker at some of these programs. So I think this would be a big get both geographically for South Carolina, but also positionally, because I think you could probably uh, experiment with Daniel, much like we talk about with the Nicholas Harbor types of the world uh, in, in this past recruiting cycle. So, yeah, I think the momentum right now is, is with South Carolina for Hill. I don't know if Bama's going away or their approach. Always something to keep an eye on, as, as we talked about with, with Dylan Stewart and others. So uh, we'll see what the Auburn trip looks like going forward. But as we record this, Andrew, 
South Carolina has made up the most ground in the shortest amount of time. And that's a big deal because this is, again, a legitimate two-way four-star prospect. And there's just not a lot of those in any recruiting cycle, much less in the state of Mississippi, where it's, it's again, very hard to go in there and recruit, even for the Alabamas, Georgias of the world. It's not simple to, to go in that state and, and win recruiting battles. There's like a couple a year, maybe, that leave the state among the best prospects in the SIP. So fascinating recruitment there and, and a really great player if you hadn't seen him. It was good to talk to John Garcia, Jr., Locked On's resident recruiting insider on both Dylan Stewart and Daniel Hill. And again, based on what he said, it seems like the Gamecocks are in a really good spot for Daniel Hill. And it still remains the case also with Dylan Stewart. But obviously with Dylan Stewart, the competition is going to be stiff. Again, we all probably could have seen this coming from the very beginning. Ohio State's making a big push here. Alabama, Georgia. Those seem to be the three other teams to watch along with South Carolina right now at this current moment. But again, the Gamecocks, they are by no means out of this race. They're going to get their chance to, again, remind Dylan Stewart why he's visited their program more than any other up to this point. And put themselves, again, back in the driver's seat, and maybe even create a bit of a cushion between themselves and the rest of these Blue Blood programs. All right, now let's switch gears on over from the gridiron to the hardwood. As South Carolina's women's basketball program, obviously they are now fully in the throes of the offseason. And while they're going to be looking ahead now to the future of the program, you know, who's going to take over for an Leah Boston? You know, who's going to take over at those guard spots? Who's going to be the volume shooter for this team? Who's going to be the two-way player that Bree Beal was? Who's going to fill in those roles? Obviously, they got plenty of time to figure out all of those questions, but they also get one more chance on Monday night to recognize and honor the class that led them to such national prominence over the last four years. As the WNBA draft is taking place later tonight on ESPN and will start at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And the Gamecocks could be in for a potential record-setting night. As based on the current ESPN projections from M.A. Vopel, which were put out there three days ago, admittedly, Aliyah Boston is currently projected to be the first overall pick in the WNBA draft and be selected by the Indiana Fever, which would reunite her with former teammate and national champion Destiny Henderson. Bree Beal is projected to go seventh overall to the Indiana Fever. Letitia Ami here is projected to go eighth overall to the Atlanta Dream. Now, if the Gamecocks were to get three first round picks, in this draft as this projection has it. It would be the seventh time overall in the modern era of the draft since 2010 and the second time in South Carolina's history that three players were drafted in the first round. The first time it happened was back in 2017 for South Carolina where Alana Coates, Alicia Gray, and Kayla Davis, all part of that 2017 national title team, got drafted in the first round in that cycle. Now to get back to the projections from M.A. Vopel, he has Zaya Cook being the first pick in the second round, 13th overall, also to the Indiana Fever. So apparently the Indiana Fever, based on these projections, are just going to essentially take South Carolina's entire starting lineup from the 2022 run that they had and just put them all together. And Destiny Henderson, Bree Beal, Zaya Cook, and Aaliyah Boston. That would be quite crazy if that's truly the way that this whole thing plays out. And then... M.A. has one more Gamecock being drafted in his projection, as in the third round, he has Victoria Saxton being drafted 27th overall, not to the Indiana Fever, but to the Phoenix Mercury. So that would be five Gamecocks in total, again, if it ends up playing out this way. So this leads into sort of one more question that might be lingering in some people's minds. With the massive difference in how the WNBA pays its players, which admittedly is nowhere near to the same degree as the NBA, I'm not going to get into all that. Save that discussion for another time amongst yourselves and other people. But does the amount of draft picks still hold weight here? If South Carolina were to see three players get drafted in the first round and five players get drafted overall, absolutely it does. Because here's the thing. Don Staley and her staff, obviously the way they have now built this basketball program, they have built it to where it is self-sustainable, but at the same time, it is very much a development program. They're going to take in a lot of talented players, but there's very few true freshmen that come to South Carolina these days and start from day one. 
you're going to come in here, and what Don Staley is usually going to tell these players when they come and sit down in her office is, listen, I understand that where you come from, you ran your high school. You ran maybe your district or your state. You won a state championship. You were named the Gary Player of the Year. You were a five-star recruit, a McDonald's All-American, all that good stuff. Hold numerous high school records. But you're not going to be playing here immediately as a starter. You're going to be playing a different role, maybe, than you were playing in your senior year of high school. And you're going to have to wait your turn before you can actually get starting minutes on the floor here at South Carolina. And obviously, with the way that Don Staley and her staff employed this kind of strategy for obviously roster balance, trying to not upset the apple cart in terms of morale and emotions, but also, again, making sure that they're properly developing these players, there's an inherent trade-off there. Because now, since they've seen so much success at South Carolina, players are a lot more willing to come in here and buy into that message because they know what Don Staley can do for them as an individual player and also to help them accomplish team goals. But at the same time, the trade-off is this. If Don Staley and her staff are going to ask these players to do that sort of thing, they have also got to show results in terms of player development. That means you've got to be sending players to the WNBA. You ought to be having players that are earning multiple postseason honors. And that has been happening in recent years. So having something like five players get drafted, period, and three first-round draft picks goes a long ways. Yes, again, I know the pay is not all that grand in the WNBA. It still matters to a certain extent in terms of a recruiting pitch that Don Staley can now give to these high school prospects. And that is why Monday night is so important for her and the future of the program because it just backs up the messaging and, again, the mentality that she tries to instill in terms of sacrificing for the good of the team, for the good of the program, and understanding that, look, if you just put in the work, your time's going to come. It's just not going to happen for you immediately. That's extremely important for Dawn Staley, and that's why the WNBA draft tonight is very important for her. And again, it is one more chance for this program to celebrate everything that this special 2019 recruiting class did for this program. So again, that will all be taking place starting at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on ESPN if you're interested in tuning in to see who ends up going where in the WNBA draft. But with that being said, y'all, that is going to do it for today's show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. I hope y'all thoroughly enjoyed today's show as always. What do y'all think about what Shane Beamer said at his press conference this past Tuesday? Do you think that it resembles or is emblematic of a coach like a Nick Saban in terms of sort of all the points that he hit on with his team and trying to avoid complacency? Let me know your thoughts on that topic and all the other ones I discussed down below in the comments section if you watch today's show on YouTube. Or, if you listen to today's show on an audio podcast app, you can shoot me a direct message on Twitter, at A-Line underscore SC. And once again, thank y'all so much for making the Lockdown Gamecocks podcast your first watch or listen here today. If you're interested in more content from the Lockdown Gamecocks podcast, then you can go onto YouTube and subscribe to the Lockdown Gamecocks YouTube page. And click the bell for notifications, and that way you'll know when future shows are posted. You can also give us a follow wherever you get your audio podcast daily. And along with Twitter, the Locked On Gamecocks podcast is now also on Facebook. So you can also go on Facebook, just look up Locked On Gamecocks, and you should be able to find the page there. And that way, we can all have discussions regarding South Carolina athletics, both past, present, and future. But again, I already appreciate the support y'all have shown me just by watching or listening to today's show. So thank y'all once again. I really hope that y'all enjoyed today's show. Have a great rest of your Monday and a fantastic start to the work week. And I will catch y'all on the next show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast.